The problem that often arises is that we often think about, you know, socialist revolutions like, you know, a communist revolution where a minority of, of revolutionaries take over and rapidly transform and, ups, and take over the society and, and impose mm -hmm. a, their, their, their uh, totalitarian system. Uh, but, but the fact is, is that there, there, there can be one that, that occurs like this in slow motion, in that the government intervenes and regulates here, and then the government intervenes and regulates there. And all the interventions and regulations cumulatively create imbalances, distortions, uh, 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 unprofitable circumstances, such that then the government has to intervene again to try to compensate for the negative consequences and outcomes of its prior intervention. And then another layer of intervention and another layer of intervention. And each layer of intervention is reducing the degree to which the market is competitively open and free and not overlaid with this heavy handedness of government and politicized control and regulation until a point is reached. And, it's, and I'm not saying it's easy to say, you know, what is that point in which the system changes over from system A to system B? Yeah. But at some point, the degree to which the government has intruded itself into market and social affairs uh, is so weighty that you no longer have any meaningful free market and you basically have some form of a command or planned uh, economy. Now, as you're saying, it comes under many different names. It can be called socialist or communist or fascist, or as under the Nazi system, national socialist. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, all of them are merely variations on the theme of government taking over the primary paternalistic and political responsibility of directing, controlling, commanding, and determining uh, what gets produced, how it's produced, uh, to whom the output is distributed, and so forth. Until yeah. finally you basically have no market economy left, but but, but basically a planned society from the top down. Well, now what we see as well, and one thing that I think uh, a reason that people still believe that it's the capitalist fault is because they see a lot of cronyism, right? Like they see mm -hmm. that there are these mergers, these deals that are happening between governments, mm -hmm. big corporations, or very, very powerful people who in some cases now, some organizations are more powerful than governments and have more of a sway on things. Yeah, you see, you see, one version of the command and controlled or a paternalistically guided economy is, is what in the 20th century uh, took its form uh, under the name of fascism. Um, fascism uh, was born, if you will put it that way, in Italy in the years immediately after the First World War with its leader and founder, Benito Mussolini. Uh, Benito Mussolini, before the First World War, had been one of the most prominent members of the Italian Socialist Party. In fact, he was the editor of the leading socialist newspaper in those pre-World War I years, uh, an Italian socialist newspaper called Avante. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the First World War, uh, he, he decided that, that he, Italy needed to be more nationalistic, uh, and less internationalist, as the other forms of Marxian socialism had focused upon in, in ideological principle. For 2,500 years, the Pontine marshes were a blot on Italy. But today, Mussolini has accomplished the historic task. He has drained the Pontine marshes, and the swamps have been turned into solid, rich farmland, ready for the hundreds of thousands of happy peasant folk. Already the first town has been built and dedicated, and they call it Mussolini. Hail Mussolini. And uh, what he therefore advocated was another version of the planning and command society. And that is you don't nationalize the means of production like the Marxists and most other socialists historically had called for. And the government directly owning and then controlling and planning what got produced, how, where, when, and for whom. Mm -hmm. Instead, most industry would be left in private hands but the government would overlay it with planning agencies and authorities that would dictate the prices at which the goods were sold, the types and, and, and amounts of output that each firm and industry would manufacture and offer on the market, and to whom it could sell it and in what quantities, the wages and the work conditions under which people would be employed. So basically, it's, it's just another version of a planned economy as the traditional image of, of socialism with direct government ownership, 
but merely on paper, things remain in private hands and the government has agencies that tell the private owners what to do. Now, there's a symbiotic relationship here. And, and that's a big element of what, what we have in the American economy uh, un, under our form of, of, of special interest politics, because certainly those who are being regulated or those who are receiving government expenditures for one purpose or another have a motive and incentive to participate in the political process to try to see that the subsidies, the government spending, continue to go in their ways uh, to benefit themselves within the context of what the government is planning and attempting to do. For, for example, <clears throat> there's a big push you know, for, 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 for green alternatives to fossil fuels, solar, wind power. Well, wh who's gonna be producing and supplying these things? Mm -hmm. There are solar panel manufacturers. They're, 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 they're the builders of the wind turbines and going on through all the other variations on this theme. They have strong incentives to lobby and push for more government involvement, more government spending, more government insistence that those forms of energy provision be provided instead of fossil fuels, because that's where the money is going to come to them. So you have sort of this interlocket interlocked uh, uh, connection b between the, the, uh, the, the political ideologues who want to transform the society into this green revolution. On this vote, the yeas are 220, the nays are 213, the Build Back Better bill is passed. Uh, the bureaucrats who make their living uh, being part of these structures, imposing and determining and guiding and commanding, and the groups in the private sector who will be the beneficiaries of that expenditure largesse. And in an age where this pandemic is made so painfully clear that no nation can wall itself, wall itself off from borderless threats, we know that none of us can escape the worst that's yet to come if we fail to seize this moment. But ladies and gentlemen, within the growing catastrophe, I believe there's an incredible opportunity, not just for the United States, but for all of us. We're standing at an inflection point in world history. We have the ability to invest in ourselves and build an equitable, clean energy future, and in the process, create millions of good paying jobs and opportunities around the world. Cleaner air for our children, more bountiful oceans, healthier forests and ecosystems for our planet. We can create an environment that raises the standard of living around the world. And this is a moral imperative, but it's also an economic imperative. If we fuel greater growth, new jobs, better opportunities for all our people, and as we see current volatility in energy prices rather than cast it as a reason to back off our clean energy goals, we must view it as a call to action. High energy prices only, only reinforce the urgent need to diversify, diversify sources, double down on clean energy development, and adapt promising new clean energy technologies so we can not only oh, oh, we don't remain overly reliant on one source of power to power our economies and our communities. It's in the self-interest of every single nation. And this is a chance, in my view, to make a generational investment in our economic resilience and in our workers and our communities throughout the world. That's what we're going to do in the United States. My Build Back Better framework will make historic investments in clean energy, the most significant investment to deal with the climate crisis that any advanced nation has made ever. We're going to cut U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by well over a gigaton by 2030, while making it more affordable for consumers to save.